Um, I'm going to keep my remarks very brief because, you know, we had this idea that uh, um, to bring in some of my members from my sophomore class. So you got to see that the experiment continues to work, that you actually elected people that think outside the box, that are real live people uh, that believe in solutions at the local level. And one of the people that, uh, that I've always said about is, is Mick Mulvaney. And Mick Mulvaney's from South Carolina. Uh, he's in my class, and he's got a great set of skill sets, maybe a little different than mine. His background is his family's business was in construction. He went to Georgetown University, got some of the highest marks um, that the university can give in economics. He went to law school. Um, he actually taught the MBA, he was an instructor for the MBA at Harvard. Uh, this is a guy that, um, if you want to know monetary policy, interest rates, what's going on business, this is the guy in our class that we trust. And so I want to give you a chance to actually hear from him. It also gives you an idea of what the future may bring um, because there's, there's other good guys out there. And this is an asset. He may represent a different district in this country, but he's also a representative of yours. And so when you know that the assets that he holds, you can actually understand and, and trust what he comes to the table with. So the way we're going to work this, I'm going to introduce Mick Mulvaney. He's going to make a presentation, then we're going to take questions. I will tell you we're on a little short leash tonight. Um, otherwise, you know me, I'd be here three hours. <laughs> i take all your questions. But we got to get Mick back uh, to the airport um, for uh, a, a red eye. So, you know, the classic uh, red eye flight to get back to, to, to D.C. <laughs> so without further ado, I would like to honor, uh, introduce my friend um, and colleague, Congressman Mick Mulvaney. Uh, thanks, Paul, for having me. Uh, real quickly, somebody asked me the, the best opening question, which is, why are you here? Uh, why is somebody from South Carolina coming to Prescott, Arizona to do this? Uh, and we've actually we've done this in South Carolina a little bit amongst our delegation. By the way, our two delegations are, are pretty close. Um, the South Carolina delegation and Arizona delegation spent a lot of time together. We like each other. And what we discovered back home was that uh, I'm on various committees. I used to be on the Budget Committee, the Joint Economic Committee. Now I'm on the Financial Services Committee. Um, and other members of my delegation might be at other committees. And we started doing joint town halls, and people really liked it because if you had a question on immigration, I wouldn't have to give you the answer that's sort of the third-hand answer because I'm not really heavily involved with it. You would have somebody else there who's really sort of spent a lot more time on it. Paul and I work a lot, a lot like that because Paul's on oversight and government reform. Um, so if you've got questions about the IRS scandals, the various scandals we're dealing with, that's the, what his committee deals with. He also spends a lot of time on natural resources, which I know are important in this area, and he spent a lot of time and energy on immigration. It's not that big a deal where I'm from. Certainly it's important to the nation as a whole, but it's not as immediately pressing in South Carolina as it is, say, in Arizona. On the other hand, I've been spending the last couple years on budgets, debts, the deficit, etc. cetera. Um, I'm one of the co-authors of the Republican Study Committee budget from the last couple years. Um, this is the, the RSC, the committee is the conservative wing of the Republican Party, and we offer our alternative budgets every year, uh, the one that's a little bit more conservative even than Mr. Ryan's thing. Um, so I'm going to talk tonight, ordinarily I talk about uh, 40 minutes, uh, but I do that in my best Southern, which is a lot slower. And <laughs> so today I can, I can uh, I'll, I'll speak a little bit quicker and we'll be able to move through it, I think, assuming I can get this thing to work. So I'm going to talk about spending debt and the deficit. Um, and Paul and I came to the class in 2010, and I found this quotation from John Kennedy, uh, which sort of rest, made me rest a little bit easier that we weren't the first people to get to Washington and go, holy cow, I had no idea it was that bad. Clearly, uh, that's been going on since the early 1960s at least, and my guess is it probably goes back to the very beginning of the country. Um, I knew with this. Um, this is, um, this was, I was on the budget committee and I was hearing all these things about how, how bad the, the, the debts were, the deficits were, and I decided because the guy that I beat, I was the first Republican in 130 years, the guy that I beat was the budget chairman. And so the folks with my district wanted me to know a lot about the budget. So I threw myself heavily into the budget, got on that committee, and started doing all this research. And I kept thinking to myself, well, is it really as bad as I've heard? And I came across this, I had a stack about that big of papers that I had to read the first month I was there. At about the fourth piece of paper, there was this quotation, all right? And it caught my attention because it's pretty stark. I think the biggest threat we have to our national debt, or to national security, is our debt. Uh, but I've been in politics just long enough to know that if that's, uh, if that's Nancy Pelosi saying it or John Boehner saying it, it's probably political rhetoric and I can dismiss it. It wasn't. Um, it was this guy. 
Um, when the guy who's in charge of the guns and the bullets and the helicopters and the airplanes tells you that the biggest threat to national security is the debt, that got my attention. Uh, and it should get yours. This is much more, uh, this is about much more than just dollars and cents. This is really about everything that we do in a nation, and, and that includes national security. Um, one of the first things I learned, however, when I got there was that I had no idea what a trillion dollars is. I don't think anybody knows what a trillion dollars is. It's simply a, a dollar figure that nobody can understand. Um, if, you, if you, we spent four trillion dollars uh, last year, if that was a stack of hundred dollar bills, it would be 3,156 miles high. That is a meaningless number, okay? All we know is that's really, really, really big, okay? So what I did in my office is change it. You may have seen this on, on Fox News, a couple other people have taken it. By the way, we always do try and share good ideas. If Paul has a good idea on messaging, we have, we have methods for sharing with our fellow colleagues that write the same thing. So you may have seen this before. Um, we took all of the numbers and changed them into numbers that I could understand and then go back and tell my folks in South Carolina about. So I don't talk about trillions and hundreds of millions and billions. I talk in numbers I can understand. Last year, as a nation, we made about $78,000, okay? That's what we made. Excuse me, that's not good. We made 46, I haven't done this in a while. $46,000, yet we spent 78. I want you to imagine this is your household, this is your family, that you and your husband, you and your wife are sitting down in January of a year to do a budget, and you say, sweetie, how much did we make last year? Well, we made $46,000. How much did we spend? We spend seventy-eight. dollars okay? This is a really, really bad place to start a budget discussion in a household. I've had ones that were close to that, but not quite that bad. Um, and imagine what you, what, the, the sinking feeling you would get if you realized that you made $46,000, but you spent $78,000. You might say, wait a second, I need to start doing something different. Uh, I need to figure a way to start to cut back. Um, maybe I might have to borrow a little bit of money to get me through here, and you turn to your, your husband and say, uh, what's, what's the visa bill, by the way, while we're sitting here looking at this? And the visa bill, uh, let's see, it actually goes off the top of this chart. Uh, we did this in 2011. It's now $340,000. So that's your family. The ordinary family in South Carolina makes about $46,000 a year, just slightly more than that. They don't spend 78, but they make 46. They understand these numbers. My guess is y'all can understand these numbers. Imagine where your family would be if you're making $46,000 a year, you're spending 78, but you owe 320-odd, uh, $340,000, not on the mortgage, not on the mortgage, but on the visa bill. Okay? That's where we are as a nation. But why do I tell people that? Why do, why do I lay this out first in these presentations? Number one, um, to be honest with people about the facts on the ground. But number two, to let them know that yes, it is as serious as they, as they probably heard. It's not rhetoric, it's not hyperbole. Number three, um, to explain why you might start hearing politicians, including Republicans, talk about things that for years we've not talked about doing. We're talking about looking at Social Security, looking at Medicare, there'll be questions about that tonight. I offered a bill to freeze military spending for one year, something that five or 10 or 20 years ago Republicans would never do. But if you realize that this is the condition of the nation, then you start to realize, wait a second, we have to start looking at everything. Lastly, it also helps me articulate to people and explain to people how difficult it is to fix, okay? These numbers are real, by the way. The $46,000 roughly equates to the $2.3 trillion that we had a couple years ago. The $78,000 is the $3.9 trillion in expenditures, and the roughly $340,000 now is the $17 trillion in debt. So these are real numbers simply made smaller, but they're still consistent with the exact experience that we have as a nation. There's another experience we have, which is what we did to our own budgets. Paul and I get money to do this. He's got staffers here today. His office is in Prescott and other towns. I have a couple of offices. We have offices in D.C. And we get a budget to do that. Collectively, we decided to cut $35 million from that budget last year. Right? I remember when I was in the private sector, $35 million was a lot of money. But when I translate it to this, and I'm trying to save $32,000 a year so that I can start paying down my $340,000 of visa bills, $35 million represents 70 cents. Wow. That's how hard it is to fix. That's how big the problem is. Those are the challenges that we face. Anyway, so I'm gonna move through the rest of this a little bit more quickly. People ask me all the time, um, is it true that we borrow 40 cents of every dollar we spend? Yeah, it's actually about 38 this year. It came down a little bit, but 40 is basically the number. 
Um, the rising national debt, one of my favorites. This is um, debt as a percentage of GDP. We usually don't talk about the size of the debt in terms of the dollars because the dollar in World War II is not the same as the dollar today. So we measure in terms of the size of the overall economy, which is also the national income. Okay? Back at the end of World War II, our debt was equal to one year's worth of national income. Right? And then it started coming down, and it stayed fairly steady until about 1980, then it came up for a little bit, then down a little bit, um, and there's where we were. Let me see if I can get this. Uh, what am I doing wrong, boys? If you can take me forward one, that would be great. Anyway, um, while, they, while they work through that, uh, okay, there we go. Ah, uh, we got it, good, good, good. You still got it? There we go, there's where we were when I, when I first did this in 2010, and that's what I want to show you. Okay? Want to know what's really frightening? A couple different things. We've not been able to find a civilization, a government that survives past this number, 400%. If you know of one, by the way, please let us know. I don't, I don't pretend that everything I do here is absolutely correct. I'm fully willing to admit that stuff that I have is wrong. If I tell you something is a useful way that is wrong, please just let me know. I, I want to give folks good information. We've never been able to find a government that survives past 400%. The other thing that's really frightening is that this is what's happened. This is what happens if we do nothing. Okay, this is not assuming any grave changes. It's not you know Republicans win, Democrats win. This is simply if the law that is in place today for things like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, all of defense, everything simply stays the same. That's all that happens. This is what happens if Congress does nothing. I have news for you. Congress is much better at doing nothing than it is at doing something. Um, but we have to do something because that is the future that we face. Um, by the way, for those of you who think it's just the Democrats uh, who have done this to us, you're absolutely wrong. Um, it's been everybody. Um, certainly the current Obama administration has taken it to new heights, um, but every single administration um, has, has run up the debt. Think about it. If it had just been the Republicans doing this for the last 30 years, the Democrats would have been uh, screaming holy murder. The opposite of truth was just Democrats. The truth of the matter is both parties have been complicit in this. You cannot run up this much debt in this nation without both parties participating in it. Um, where do we spend our money? Uh, a lot of, we, we have mandatory spending is what we budget. Dis, excuse me, mandatory spending is what we don't budget. Discretionary spending is what we do budget. So when Paul and I vote on the budget, we actually only vote on about 40 cents out of every dollar that is spent, okay? Most of the money, the majority of the money that we spend as a government is on what some people call entitlement, some people call mandatory, I call automatic spending, and that means it happens automatically. You get your social security check every single year after you turn a certain age. You get your um, uh, Medicare, the same. You get Medicaid uh, if you qualify for it. We don't budget for that. We only budget for what's in blue. What's in red is automatic spending. People ask me all the time, why do you always go and look to try and, 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 and balance the budget on the backs of, so, of senior citizens? Okay? First of all, no one's trying to do that. But the truth of the matter is, if you're going to deal with spending in this country, you're going to have to deal with the red. In fact, the truth of the matter is, go back a slide or two, we could cut every single penny out of what Paul and I budget for. Non-defense discretionary defense system. Every single government agency that you know about. The, the, the uh, Department of Defense, the USDA, the FAA, the FBI, the USDA, every single one, all of that, to zero. Cut my salary to zero, Paul's salary to zero, our budget to zero. Everything that we do in all of those agencies to zero, and we'd still be in deficit last year. That's how big the mandatory spending programs are. Uh, we'll go try and speed up my notes. Um, all right, I've got the three slides. What keeps me up at night, number one? Uh, if you remember three things from this tonight, this is the ones to remember. Number one, if we keep the defense budget at the same level it is today in constant dollars, the same size, and allow it to grow with only inflation, but retirement benefits for military uh, vets increases at its current rate, by the year 2047, every single penny we spend on defense will go only to retirement benefits. There will not be a penny for a soldier, there will not be a penny for a bullet, there will not be a penny for a plane. Right? This, this is one of the things that keeps me up at night. We have a, a serious problem that is growing within the military and it becomes how are we going to pay the pension benefits for the folks um, that we made promises to. Number two, what else keeps me up at night? Um, you can look at Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and by themselves about the year 2050, they take up every single penny that we make. 
Okay? No money for anything else. If you don't reform any of these systems, these, these three programs will gobble up every single penny that the government takes in by about the same year, 2050. Um, this is the last one. This is the one that, oh, goodness gracious, it's not in there. Oh! Did I miss it? Hang on. Can you guys go forward one? There you go. This is the one that really bugs me because this is the one that, that people don't realize. This is the cancer that's eating away at us that nobody talks about, and it's interest payments on the debt. I asked the Congressional Budget Office to simply show me two things. Show me the revenues for the next 75 years that we expect this government to take in. Okay, that is the green line. Show me the interest payments on the debt. Okay? Again, that's if we do nothing. All right? This is why governments don't, don't exist past 400% of GDP as we talked about before. They end up paying all of their money in to interest payments on the debt. And this is the cancer that's eating away at us. People ask me, what do I worry about the most? This. Because we talk about Social Security, we talk about Medicare, we talk about defense spending, we talk about everything. We don't talk about this. We have borrowed so much money from our children and our grandchildren that we will never ever pay back um, that this is the future that these kids face. Uh, by the way, one of the things that always disappoints, this is a great crowd tonight, uh, it's a really good crowd as a matter of fact. I've done this for as many as 400 people, I've done it for as few as four. Um, you know what's really disappointing, it's a great crowd. What's disappointing about this crowd? Turn around and look at the average age of the folks who are here. This is not your problem. Okay? It's a problem that you and I have created, but none of us are going to live with the real consequences of this problem. The people who are going to live with it are not in the room. The reason that we've allowed ourselves to get into this situation is because the people who are affected by this are never in the room. We take money from the next generation, and they, since they don't vote, and we do, we have voted ourselves wonderful things out of the public treasury without paying for it, and we're making our kids and our grandkids pay for it. Um, uh, by the way, what do we do with it? Uh, this is something fancy. We raise taxes on the wealthy. You raise taxes on the wealthy all you want to. The point of this graph is to show you that even when uh, marginal tax rates on the wealthy were at 90% back in the 50s and 60s, the government took about 20 cents out of every dollar of national income. Look how steady that line is across the bottom. <laughs> tax rates go up, tax rates go down. The government still takes about 19 cents out of every dollar. Um, the Republicans will tell you that if you cut taxes dramatically, we'll, take, uh, we'll raise revenue. Democrats will tell you if we increase taxes dramatically, we'll raise revenue. The truth of the matter is, we only take about 19 cents. Well, how, does, how, how does our money actually grow? How does the size of the, the, the revenues grow? Not because of the tax rates, but because of the size of the pot. How big is the economy? How big is that 19 cents out of every dollar? Government takes about 19 cents out of every dollar. How does it get more? Not by taking 20 cents out of the same number of dollars, but by taking 19 cents out of more dollars. And this has always been uh, what we've done. The two lines here, by the way, are the tax revenues on one side and the GDP of the overall economy, size of the American economy. You can see how closely those two things move together. Um, who bears the tax burden? You've probably seen this. Um, the top 1% pay about 40%, the bottom 50 pay about three, but we'll move through this real quickly. I don't know what this slide is. Oh, uh, people ask me all the time, but we cut forward assistance. These are just examples. People call my office and say, well, you know, if you simply stop taking this out, then you can balance the budget. So I got a couple of examples of things that I hope pop up. Foreign affairs, okay, that's 4% of, uh, of our debt. Uh, waste, fraud, and abuse, 6%. Uh, my, my, my salary, Paul's salary, one half of 1%. Um, you can't do this by cutting any one program. Like I said, you could cut everything that we budget, and you'd still be in deficit. Uh, won't cutting, hurting, and spending hurt the economy? Uh, it's, that hasn't in the past. Uh, hasn't in other countries, it hasn't in us. We walked through, again, I'll give you the shorter version. Um, Sweden faced a similar circumstance back in the 90s. So did New Zealand, so did Canada. And all of them dramatically reduced their spending. And what they found was when the government spent less, the private sp sector actually spent more. Um, and that's what put them back to work. My Republican friends hate this graph. My Republican friends hate this graph. I tell my Republican friends, listen, you can take credit for it if you want to because you were in charge. We were in charge of the House um, and the Senate during this time. Democrats um, like to take credit for it because Bill Clinton was president. Look at the size of the federal roles, the federal employees, beginning November of 1991. So right about here is November of 1992. Who got elected president in November 1992? Bill Clinton. Look at the size of the federal government between 1992 and 2000. The size of the federal government went down. And every time my Democrat friends come back and say, oh, we need to have the Clinton era rates because we had wonderful uh, growth during that time, I show up this graph and I said, the reason we had wonderful growth during the 1990s was because the government spent less. 
And when the government spends less, private sector spends more, and that's what puts people back to work. Um, I'll skip through these. Again, it, it would investment, the top line there is private investment as a percentage of the overall economy. The bottom is the unemployment rate. And I can show you that when investment goes up, unemployment goes down. Investment goes down, unemployment goes up. It's private investment that drives real job growth in this country, not government spending. Um, what else have we got? Paul, I'm almost finished. Uh, fix the tax system. One of my favorite slides. 1972, 88% of the households in this country participated in the income tax system. 88%. Everybody did. Everybody pay, played a part. Everybody paid into the system. Today, it's roughly half. Okay? One of the biggest mistakes I think that Mitt Romney made during the presidential campaign was not to embrace that 47% because that is a national debate that needs to be had. It's not true to say that half the people don't pay taxes. Absolutely not true. Most people pay taxes, about 80% because so many people pay the payroll tax. But remember, if you pay payroll taxes, you're not paying for the government. You pay payroll tax, you're paying for your own benefits, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Right? If you only pay payroll tax, you're not paying for national defense, you're not paying for education, you're not paying for transportation, you're not paying for food safety. Only the income tax and the other taxes pay for this. The payroll tax does not pay for that. Um, I asked a question one time of one of the leading um, liberal economists in the nation, he teaches at Yale, and I threw this graph up there, and I said, asked what I thought was a relatively uh, rhetorical question. I said, don't you think everybody should pay at least one dollar for defense? Don't you think everybody who lives here should pay one dollar for defense? Again, I thought it was a rhetorical question. His answer was, well, Congressman, I, I, I believe for a long time, and I think a lot of people agree with me, that people should pay into the tax system based upon their ability to pay into the system, and they should receive benefits from the tax system commensurate with their need for those benefits. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> That gentleman was the leading, was the, uh, the lead economic advisor to the Democrats in the Senate, United States Senate. Okay? Um, so not everybody agrees uh, with me that everybody should pay taxes. Uh, fiscal cliff, we'll skip that. That was a disaster. I know Paul's probably brought you up to speed. Raise your hand if you paid more taxes because of the fiscal cliff. <laughs> everybody here with a job paid more, um, which is not what we were told. We were told only rich people would pay more. Everybody paid more. Um, what else we got? What will Congress do? Um, Oh, this is my, yeah, I'm moving towards the end here. Who, who said this? That's Thomas Jefferson, one of my favorite. This is um, uh, a new one, though. It is difficult to get a man to understand something when his job depends upon his not understanding it. <laughs> People ask me all the time, how did we get here? Why didn't someone tell us before now? This is why. Okay? It used to be that Republicans and Democrats had a, had a fairly stark choice, okay? If they wanted to balance the budget, Republicans could cut spending because if they raised taxes, they lost their jobs. And Democrats could, 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 could figure out a way to either, if they, if, they, if they cut spending, they lost their jobs, so they wanted to raise taxes. So that was the natural balance. Do you raise, raise taxes or cut spending? And in about 1980, they figured out there was a third choice. The third choice was to run up tremendous debts. And that's what we've been operating on for the last 30 years. People ask me all the time, why can't you all get along in Washington anymore? And the answer is because I'm sick and tired of borrowing money to buy bipartisanship. And that's what we've done for the last 30 years. We've greased the wheels of government by simply borrowing money. People ask me all the time, why don't you compromise more? I said, the problem with it is we compromise too much. Because every time we compromise, we end up running up the debt. All right? This is why we're in the difficulty that we're in. For many, many years, Politicians have assumed, Republican politicians have said if they raised your taxes, you'd lose, that you'd fire them. Democrat candidates have said if they cut your, cut your spending, you'd fire them. And that has to change. You have to start firing people in politics because they run up their debt. And when you start punishing them for running up debt, the same way you used to for, for uh, either raising taxes or cutting spending, then you'll see Washington change. Washington doesn't lead, it follows. Um, and you just need to send the message um, that you're not going to stomach any more debt. Um, I was only said one thing the whole time I was in Congress that I was actually proud of. Um, I was actually in a, um, a budget meeting, and I said this. Uh, I said, uh, we're having a budget meeting. It was open to the public. And I said, you know what? I think we really need to look at raising the Social Security age on folks like myself. And a reporter asked me afterwards, pulled me aside, said, Mr. Mulvaney, can I talk to you for a second? I said, yeah. He said, he said are you crazy? And I said, I'm in Congress, I'm a little bit crazy, but my definition. He said, you just, in, open, in an open meeting, in a public forum, suggested raising the Social Security age. This, is, this has always been guaranteed political loss. This is, this is a failure on your part. I said, look, I came here to tell people the truth, to learn what the truth was and to tell people the truth. They fired me because I told them the truth. Then they had the wrong guy in the job in the first place. Mm -hmm. Nice thing about having Paul on the team. Yeah.
I know Paul feels the same. And the, there's a large group of folks in 2010 who are not career politicians. They never wanted to grow up saying, oh, I've always wanted to be a congressman. They didn't sort of tailor their career path to do that. Um, they're just doing the job because they know it's an important job to do. Uh, and they're not in the business of coming back and telling you a bunch of things you want to hear so that you get reelected. They're here to learn what's going on, to learn what the difficulties are, share that with you, then try and work together with, with ways to fix the thing. That's one of the reasons I'm here for Paul is because I know Paul feels very strongly about that. I don't do this for just everybody. I have 13-year-old triplets, by the way. My wife would kill me if I did this for everybody. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to be here. I think that's pretty much the end of the show. Um, oh, no, this is the Ryan budget. It just shows what we, Paul and I voted for to try and fix the thing by the green instead of the red, but I think that's the, that's the end of it. So um, thank you for everything. Thank I didn't know how much, I think we went a little bit over on time. But, okay. um, again, thanks. I, I'll say this one last time. Thank you for sending us Paul Gosar. Um, this, the man is, is, is critical to, to me and to us within the conservative movement, within the Republican movement. Uh, we have to have more people like him. The government does too much for any of us to know about everything. Okay? And I need to be able to turn to somebody on natural resources issues and immigration issues and on the scandals and the oversight because I simply don't have time to do it. It took me two years just to get a little bit of a grasp of what I talked to you about tonight. Okay? When Paul talks a little bit about natural resources and the other things, we'll talk about six or eight things out of the 2,000 that the federal government does. We need more good, smart people like him, and I need you to keep sending people like him and people including him back to Washington. So that's when I'll stop, and I appreciate you. Thank you. So another, another one of the good guys. Okay, so now, just to let you know, we're going to have to end about 725. So what we'll do is I'll take some of my time away, and we'll open it up to questions. Okay? So, and, and Julie and I will be out oh, here. If you raise your question, or raise your hand, raise your question. Raise your hand, and we'll come to you, this lady's first. And please try and keep them short so we can get good answers from the okay. congressman. During sequester, why did the Congress allow Janet Napolitano to buy 2.1 uh, billion bullets and uh, also shotguns and armored, car, uh, armored cars under sequester? She did. And, Yes, yeah, she did. No, she did. She placed them on order. No, she, she didn't. No, she didn't. You got to have the facts. What we end up happening is, is we actually audit DHS, and they go through an ebb and flow of the year of what they use in bullets. But just like me when I was a business owner, when I was a dentist and I had to buy a bunch of stuff, what I would look is, is what I needed, let's say I needed 500 gauzes, okay? <coughs> what would it be the price per gauze if I ordered 1,000? That's exactly what DHS is required by law to do. They ask, what would a billion rounds be? But they use pretty normal over the last five to seven years. Here's your issue. The best advertisement for the Second Amendment is who? Barack Obama. Every single one of us wants to go get bullets. <laughs> so more of us, oh, I'm right there in line. But, that's, but my, my whole point is, is you, we have to deal in facts. The facts set you free. That's, that's why I brought Mick here is to help share some of those facts with you, okay? Have you gone to a... Uh... What we're asking, though, the question you should be asking is, how does DHS take inventory? Do they hold it? Do they do it all at once instead of spreading it out? So they monopolize one point of time in regards to a number of bullets? The other question you ought to be asking, too, is, you got to remember the military does the same thing. Okay, we're all in this together, so you got to start looking at it. The military and police can't get them. Well, but my, my, my whole point is, when I first ran against Dan Kirkpatrick, I asked you, I said, the Second Amendment isn't just about holding guns. It's a whole economy of the Second Amendment. So you have to embrace having brass, gunpowder, lead. What's being happening is, is we're seeing the restriction on some of those pieces coming together. That's what we have to ask. That's what the question we have to ask. But we also have to know that when you got somebody like Barack Obama in the White House, all of us run and go get our guns. Now, now, the armored vehicles, the armored miracles is not true also. There are a few that they're getting and they're utilizing them on our border in regards to bombs, okay? I want to give my men and women that are defending our border, just like across the, 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 the world over in, in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, the same privileges and, and protection to save their lives. They're my greatest asset. I don't want to send my kids nor your kids nor any of you into harm's way without the proper protection. Okay? So, 
It's a great question. Okay. Uh, hi, Congressman. Uh, my question for you is the. And your uh, name is? Oh, sorry. My name is Ryan O'Hara. Hi, Ryan. Thanks right. uh, for coming. On the conservative side, 15 to 25 billion dollars. So what we can do is we can take that to the floor. I went right at Paul Ryan. In fact, the majority leader, Eric Cantor, won't put it on the floor till I start going to the rest people because they don't want to be in bad in harm's way. And so I went right to Paul Ryan. I said, Paul. Would you, would, you, would you go with me on this one? Because you're not going to take on labor. He goes, I'm happy to because you're recalculating the, the combination. But it's a win, and we took a first step. And that's what we got to do. Mick does the same thing. We've got to do small steps all the way across because once you do that and you get success and celebrate it, everybody gets into the, into the game. Does that help? Julie? Next question. Hi, Congressman. Tom Snodgrass, Williamson Valley. Hey, Tom. Um, in light of uh, the IRS scandal, Benghazi, Fast and Furious, what have you, and the fact that uh, you're not going to get any help from the Justice Department in terms of uh, uh, rooting out the evildoers, uh, is uh, uh, Congressman Issa and the Congress going to be able to have enough juice to do anything? Are we going to ever see any kind of resolution to this thing, or is this just going to go on and on with hearings and, and nipping at their heels, uh, you know, just kind of ankle biting. Well, I'm glad you brought that question up. You know, I'm, I'm one, Daryl, Daryl's my mentor and I'm one of the pit bulls on that, and along with one of our colleagues, Trey Gowdy. Let's step back for a second, okay? Um, contempt charges with Eric Holt. I'm not a fan of Eric Holt. I've got a resolution on the, co on, on the floor. Uh, we've got now 135 signatures. Um, we got 90 in the month alone, without even really pushing. I'm actually putting in Democrats in arms way because this is the same legislation that they put forward on on uh, Attorney General Gonzalez. Okay, a couple things have happened that haven't reached the media. Remember Dennis Burke, the U.S. Attorney out of Tucson? Okay. Well, about three weeks ago, when I noticed that actually the IG's report and his involvement in this came forward, they actually forwarded his. Uh, law license to the District of Columbia and Arizona for potential disbarment. I can report to you now that it's out. I sat through his deposition for two and a half hours. Both the majority, the minority, and the interrogatories together. Dennis Burke lied repeatedly during that discussion. He's also got other charges he's going to have to, to face. What it tells me is, is it's catching up. We're in court to get the documentation on Fast and Furious. Remember, as a Congress, we've roughly seen 2,600 pages unredacted out of 140,000. In order for the president to have the jurisdiction to keep it out of the courts, Eric Holder's involved, the president's inner circle's involved, or the president's involved. There is a reason they're fighting with the tooth and nail to get it out. Now, if you want to reform Washington, hold one of the political appointees to the same letter of the law. In my book, it is Eric Holder, because when you conform the Attorney General of the United States, and I've been very provocative, I said, I don't care. I mean, I did a Breibar inter interview, and my, my uh, staff cut me off coffee for the day. <laughs> I said, you know, the headlines was, quick, Eric, throw the president on the bus, because he's going to throw you under the bus. Yeah. And while you're at it, Miss Clinton, you do the same thing, because he's going to throw you the same way. Because when you start to look at this, I can tell you, in Benghazi, er um, Hillary Clinton is involved. She had to per personally sign off on Benghazi and, tri and Tripoli because it didn't fulfill our mission and our standards. She's the one who's guilty. Now, Daryl Lice is, is brilliant about it. We got Trey Gowdy who's a prosecutor, okay? So what's gonna happen? I suspect next who's coming in is Pickering, okay? And, and uh, um, at the Admiral, okay? And they're gonna have to defend their raunchy oversight of, uh, uh, record, okay? Then you're going to see more uh, whistleblowers come forward. Isn't it interesting? You probably wouldn't have heard anything from Hillary, but last week she started jumping in because she's getting nervous. It's like a mouse. When it's starting to get cornered, it wants to start coming out to try to defend itself. I don't care what she does, okay? But what's going to be interesting is who throws somebody under the bus first. Last but not least, let's talk about the IRS, okay? Something that went unheard of before the scandal. I actually chaired a hearing about navigators and assisters. Let me give you some gravity that you can share with your neighbors. Navigators and assisters are going to be hired to come to your house. There is no background check, so a convicted felon could do this. They're going to get you to sign up for health care 
on the exchanges. They will be entitled to your social security number, to your business records, to your medical insurance. And they're gonna turn it over to the log into a national database. And you're gonna do what now? News. I don't, yeah, well, everybody's scared. It doesn't matter if you're Republican, Democrat, conservative, or liberal, that scares the living bejesus out of you. Can we, uh, can we say no? Well, I mean, that's what our problem is right now, is, is that most people are gonna say no. And when you look at it, that's why it's gonna fall flat on, flat on its face. So, my mom taught me perseverance, 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 and we're going to, to end up winning. But you know what? That's why I believe in God. That's why I continue that fight, is because I see people like yourselves, I see like people like Mick Mulvaney <coughs> coming to the table to answer. And think about this. Now you saw another good guy. Imagine sitting at the table when we get this country back. We take it step by step. And think about what you're going to hand off to your kids. I want to hand it off better than what I found. Isn't that going to be fun? Yeah. I've got the next question up here. Good evening, Congress. Okay. Councilor Vic Palmel, PC in Chino Valley. I'm also the Yepi County Coordinator for the Fair Tax. I'm directing this to your, your cohort, <laughs> Congressman <laughs> Mike. Congressman, you're in the economy part of the, the bureaucracy and that your board you're sitting. Ah, that's the bureaucracy. No, I'm the legislature. <laughs> <laughs> but what I want to pass on to you is, yeah. is that we're, this has been vetted, the fair tax, since the 90s, and we've continually pursued it, but it got, got waylaid by the, the backlash of, of, of the uh, establishment in Washington, D.C. on, on the, uh, the, the negatives that came about. Most of it lobbyists because they lose their job. Not only that, but a lot of congressmen lose their power. And we know it's a challenge. But now with the current challenge of the IRS, what has come about, can you support this as upcoming? We've got a lot of congressmen sign on just recently, and we're just wondering if you'll be able to put this back so we can get this moving forward for 2014 and get this thing passed. Because as you said, our biggest enemy is not, is not enemy abroad, it's our economy that's gonna kill us. Yeah, uh, you know, we have a lot of good fair tax people in South Carolina, and we're good friends with Rob Woodall, who I think is Mr. Fair Tax in Congress. He's got the pin on and the hat all the time. Um, I don't, I don't, I not assigned, I not signed off as a co-sponsor of the fair tax bill for a specific reason, which is I don't like the prebate. We go back to the system with the prebate, by the way, this is getting deep far in the weeds, but on the prebate, a lot of people don't pay any tax at all. And I want to move to a system where everybody pays a little bit of tax so that everybody's yes. got skin yes. in the game. So that's one of my yes. difficulties with the fair tax. And they say if you want to sign on the fair tax, there's no amendments, and I want to make an amendment to change the prebate. So, uh, Rob knows that I support the idea of a, of a consumption tax. If we can figure out a fix to that, if we can also get rid of the constitutional amendment that still allows for an income tax, because the last thing I want to do is give the government an, an additional income stream without getting rid of the income tax entirely and getting and killing it once and for all. I like consumption taxes. I will tell you that um, I chair the Republican Study Committee's um, task force on tax reform. Rob Woodall is on there with me. We're working with Ways and Means to make sure that the proposals that come forward from Ways and Means on, on comprehensive tax reform can be supported by conservatives. I'll tell you that they're doing it the exact right way. Instead of taking the 70,000 pages of the current Internal Revenue Code and finding out what to take out, which subjects itself to all sorts of lobbying pressure, he's starting with one page Good. and working forward. Um, I don't think you're gonna see the country move straight to a consumption tax, but I think if we move to a flatter tax first, it would pave the way for being able to do that. I happen to support a consumption tax over an income tax, because if you tax, you tax something that you want less of. It's a conversation I have with folks about cigarette taxes all the way. Why do you want to raise my cigarettes? Well, they're bad, and we don't want people to have them. Why do you want to raise my income taxes? Uh, I don't know. Uh, so we are, we're all moving in the, in, the, in the right direction. I don't think it's, 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 it's pragmatic to think that we're going to go from where we are to the fair tax. By the way, we could probably pass a bill right now to either get rid of the IRS or or dramatically gut the IRS. There's a bill, I think you and Price have got a bill to take the IRS out of out of uh, Obamacare, which is a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The problem is we don't have the votes to change the tax code. So you end up with a IRS dependent tax system without an IRS. Uh, which, by the way, some of us want to be fine with. Um, but we, we, we do work on it. We, tax reform means a lot. I didn't get a chance to go into it tonight. We are looking at it. We're looking for a simpler, flatter, fairer system. I want to use the words fair. I know it's important to you guys. I don't want to, I'd say, give up on the idea of fairness. 
It's not fair when half the people don't pay for the running of the government. It's not fair when major corporations get huge um, uh, special treatment in the fiscal cliff bill. It's not fair when, when corporations make billions of dollars in income and don't pay taxes when they're supposed to. So um, we, we're going to continue to push fair taxes. It just won't be the fair tax right away. Julie? Okay, gentlemen, I need to let you know there's about 10 minutes left for questions, so this is your 10-minute warning bell. Question for Congressman Gosar. I can't, for the life of me, I can't speak for everybody in here, but I cannot fathom or I cannot understand where our U.S., our Arizona U.S. senators are on this immigration bill. I can't understand why they are not defending our I just state. Want, as, a, as a representative from South Carolina, yeah. I just want to thank you for that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the stop fact thinking show about, this, stop is, this is my senator is. Yes, this is not <laughs> yes, <laughs> not speculation on my part. I want to ask if you put on your Swami's hat here and perhaps give us some thoughts as where is this going to go with Boehner in the, in, in the House now? Uh, we know that our, our senators have dumped us on this issue regarding our state. But what's going to happen? What, what do you see coming down the pike in, uh, in, in the Congress? Well, let's, um, let's walk it back. Um, for Until two weeks ago, the speaker's uh, context was we wouldn't even hear the bill. And we were doing our own bills. Um, in fact, the two immigration attorneys in the whole Congress happened to be from the House. One is Bob Goodlatte, the chairman of Judiciary, and the other one's a very good friend of ours, Raul Labrador from Idaho. I'd be watching what Raul does. Raul was born in Puerto Rico to a single mom. He was raised in Las Vegas. He lives in Idaho. He's one of the most conservative members of Congress. Um, he walked away from the House side. Okay? And, and he's an immigration attorney. Okay? Two weeks ago, it changed from not bringing it up to we're monitoring. Okay? Um, one of our own, Matt Salmon, jumped all over the speaker and a bunch of others, um, trying to make sure we had the hazard rule. That if you don't have the majority of the Republicans on a bill, you ain't bringing it. Um, he changed his tune in conference this week by saying, if he didn't have the majority, he's not bringing it up. Correct. I find it problematic, first of all, because you're seeing all the pork that's being laid into this baby. Oh, yeah. You know, look at the FEMA bill. You know, you see these advertisements for, FEMA, for uh, New York? That's your FEMA dollars working, okay? About Buffalo, you see Jim Kelly talking about Buffalo and you see all the rest of them? That's your, that's your tax dollars and FEMA amounts going there. Now, I want to take you back and look up at, um, uh, an editorial by Ann Coulter two weeks ago. I think it was two weeks ago. She said if the Senate produces a bill, the House can't do anything because they're going to lose in conference. I think she's right. I do too. Okay? Because it, it, it defies all logic. I'll give you a couple of answers um, or questions you should be asking your senator. And I challenge you to go talk to them. First of all, they say no illegals get any benefits. Anybody from the hospital here? <laughs> at 1 o'clock at night, you come on my little posse, and you'll show that anybody that comes up at the emergency room gets care. So I'm tired of lies. That's why I love Mick Mulvaney. He's going to talk to you about facts. That's what I was talking to you about was facts. Facts set you free. Okay? It's even worse than that. Border security. You trust Homeland Security? I don't. Okay? What did you stand for? In, in 1070, you asked for a conglomeration of, of enforcement from the federal government, from the state government, and the local levels, all doing it the same. And I can't budge any more differently than that. I want everybody to enforce it. Okay? What works? Yuma sector. No one has crossed over illegal in the Yuma sector for six years. Why? Because everybody shares it. The military, the federal government, the local, and they got prosecutorial uh, um, oversight. No one wants to go there because they're going to get prosecuted. So I, I'm, I am really, I'm sick. Uh, in our conference three weeks ago, Jeff Flake came with a number of senators. Marco Rubio spoke, Rand Paul spoke, uh, Mike Lee spoke, Jeff Flake spoke, who else was there? Jeff Sessions spoke, somebody else. Uh, Ron Johnson. Ron Johnson, no, no, Ron, it was before. But what I gotta tell you is, I was, I was very upset um, and very mystified by body language. Uh, I was trained as a medical professional to watch you. When you come in my office, if you're sweating, I know you're hurting, okay? Um, if I watch your nervousness, you got a tick like I do right now, okay? <laughs> they don't want to see me, okay? But I watch body language. It tells me a lot about a person. 
This is what Jeff's comment. This is what Jeff did. Okay. So you need to hold them accountable because you're not going to get defensive border. Trust is a serious promise is kept. I want to see my border secured. Number two is I want a dialogue with Mexico and Canada. They have to be part of the solution. They can't be excluded, and in this bill, they're excluded from that. They have to own this problem. Okay. The other thing is, you saw what this Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. If you can't solve those problems now, why are you going to bring 30 million people in? You better solve these problems before you start thinking this thing through. Okay. There is some. There's more productivity. Yes. Some of these aspects, you're going to see increased activity. But you're also, on the other aspects, going to see more uses of, of the systems. So it's a balancing act, but you have to deal with the facts. Okay? Um, I've got one quick question and hopefully one quick answer as we're about to end. I have a very quick one. Why don't we start cutting the uh, budget by uh, grounding Air Force One? <laughs> love to. I mean, just think of opening the White House, you know, the people's house for 240 some years for the price of going to Africa. I thought maybe Skype might be a good opportunity for him to use on Africa. Yeah. 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 One, one more quick question. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I do have a question for uh, Congressman Mulvaney. Um, you said there, is that a principle in economics where there's an inverse relationship to government spending versus private spending? I mean, it seems like that this... I don't know if it's a principle of economics. It's simply, it's, it's simply what our history has, 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 has held up. Uh, there are some people who call it, call, use the term crowding out, and that is a, a, I don't know if it's a principle of economics, but it's a theory that the, the, when the government spends more, it crowds money out of the private sector okay. for various reasons. So here's my question then. It seems like this is by design, this debt. It's, it's gone exponentially with uh, Obama in office, and um, what, four or five times more? than what Bush did and than all the other previous presidents. So um, it seems like there's got to be a economic principle here that says, yeah. why are they doing this on purpose? Why are they allowing this to happen? Um, let, let, let me give you an unusual answer to your question. I, I, <coughs> um, no, it's not. I don't think this is done on purpose as part of some idea to drive the country bankrupt so we have to be socialists and the Democrats can take over. I think there's some of them who think that might be a wonderful outcome. Uh, and one way to get there, certainly you go read some of the people that the president turned to during his youth to sort of, you know, guide him. There's some fairly radical uh, political thoughts in there. Now, I, I don't think it's as contrived as that. Um, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a conversation I had with a, a high-ranking member of my own party the first six months I was there. I'd offer an amendment to cut some spending, and he walks up his arm around me, he goes, you know, you guys are all the same. You young guys, you come in here, you talk about balancing the budget. You guys have been here 30 years, and you guys come and go, and nothing ever happens with the deficit. I mean, I voted with you today, man, because I know it's the hot topic, but we all know deficits don't matter. Okay? Oh. By the way, he was quoting Vice President Dick Cheney. Okay? So, I mean, I'm telling you, that it's not just the Democrats. Again, you can't get to where we are by one party doing it. Um, when we voted for, I, uh, what did we do just recently? It was the FEMA, it was the uh, Sandy thing, okay? $60 billion. That was the third largest appropriation bill that we passed last year. It's 150% of Homeland Security. Homeland Security is about $40 billion. We have $60 billion for this, and the pork went everywhere, and they didn't care. They said, well, we've never paid for these things in the past. We're not going to start now. Think about that. What was my argument? My argument was it's so important we should actually pay for it. That we should pay for it. Not our kids, not our grandkids. We, we should pay for it. It was members of our own party who said, no, this is so important we have to borrow money from China and, from, and print money from the Fed to do this. So it's not just the Democrats. I don't do this for every Republican member of Congress. I do this for the guys and the girls who get it. Okay? And we do it for each other because we know that we form the core group that really does have a chance to fix the country if we get the opportunity. Um, but no, the, to walk out of this room and thinking it's Republicans and are, 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 are part of the solution and Democrats are always part of the problem, it's absolutely false. You need to pay more attention to the individual votes of individual folks. By the way, uh, and I'll, I'll let Paul wrap up, but I, I, I wanted to interrupt him during the part about Benghazi and the IRS, and he got a, a nice round of applause, and I want to jump up and say, that's why I'm here, because um, this is what we got to have. So thanks again for sending him, and thanks for having me. Here. So now you know why I wanted to bring Mick Mulvaney, and that's why I tell you about Mick Mulvaney.
okay? This is a guy you need to keep in your prayers. He knows that he's another one of the good guys that's on the team to get this country back, okay? So on our pursuit, I, I wouldn't be myself if I didn't tell you next Monday we got another event, okay? We have four congressmen coming in to Prescott, okay? To, to start this Don't Tread on Me, um, Fourth of July, getting back uh, this country. We're going to be taking testimony on IRS and the next scandal, which will be EPA, okay? We want to hear your stories. Um, we may have a thousand people here, okay? Freedom Works, uh, Americans for Prosperity are actually busting people up from the valley. We have had people who have put off their vacation just to come in. Let's show them the Prescott way. How about that? Okay. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of defending. I want to go on the offense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I would like to thank you so very, very much for coming out. Um, we are very blessed in this community. You know, spread the fever. I mean, it's wonderful to see all these smiling faces because I got another week of hell going back. <laughs> um, so, uh, but um, thank you very, very much for coming out tonight, and uh, we will be back, okay? Thank um, you so thank you very much.